It is uh, fascism. Is the name for this? Okay, so I, none of this has anything to do with fascism. I don't know why the word is invoked. Also, I, I think that this entire conversation betrays like a huge misunderstanding of the efficiency of capital markets. I read Klaus Schwab's book. Right. Mm -hmm. I was preparing for. I was kind of preparing for a lot of the social impacts. Obviously, I've spent a lot of time in Australia. I've seen the changes we've made. Uh, when it comes to travel policy, the tracking apps, you know, digital identity, cashless society. So I was getting ready to talk about a lot of that mm -hmm. hyper surveillance. And then the whole debate ended up being about ESGs and economics. And like, <laughs> I know, I know what I know. I know what I kind of know. And I know what I don't know. And economics is just not my expertise. Right. I just got to sit there quietly in the corner, like with cheeky banter with James, if you see us whispering to each other throughout mm -hmm. the debate. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's say that you have a company with like, let's say you've got a bunch of airlines. Okay. Okay. Let's say that airlines, um, have you ever heard of like the tragedy of the commons or like, um, any of these, these ideas that like, if one party, um, if everybody is, acts in a certain way, it'll you're fuck really going to ask us that destiny. Really? Okay. I, no, okay Do we I don't know, know like, about the tragedy of the commons. <laughs> okay. Sake. Okay. Damn. I'm just trying. Okay. But okay. <laughs> We're not let's the guy in the chat. Okay. <laughs> So let's get into this video. What's taking let's so long? Let's get into the video. So today we'll be watching Destiny versus James Lindsay versus Lauren Southern versus Peter Coffin. Right. And there's someone else there whose name escapes me, and I apologize. But this but, is uh, a big, the great, everyone's been telling us to look up the Great Reset. The Great yes. Reset. The great and reset. I, I feel like we're going to probably disappoint some people because... The, to be f who, who's I, I'm going to be honest. I don't know who's been telling me to look. No one's told me to look at the Great Reset. Oh, I've had a lot of people tell me to look oh, into okay. the Great Reset. A lot of people have commented on our videos and told us to look into the Great Reset. I see. If now you're you know, if you're conspiratorially stuff. minded, mm -hmm. first of all, this is probably you're probably not enjoying our show a lot if you're conspiratorially minded. But <laughs> the I I guess the Great Reset is something that I'm supposed to be super afraid of or, or mm. if you guys, listen, I was thinking about this. I was like, okay, people, they want some sort of conspiracy that they can worry about some sort of apocalypse. that's on the horizon. Right. And right. we are very bad about providing that apocalypse. For them, <laughs> right. I mean, do you me, agree? Me, me and you we're yeah. bad at providing apocalypses. Yeah. Okay. That's you true. And I. That is true. Yeah. You and I come in and we're like, okay, this is not really, you guys are getting all worked up over, this is yeah. not a big deal here. This is, this I'm is I'm pretty basic. optimistic about the future. I'm not pessimistic. Right. Really. Yes. So maybe yes. that's the problem. But uh, there is some, I, if I had to come up with something that you guys should worry about, I mean, I would worry more about AI being, I think AI is going to transform the 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 global s mm -hmm. economic situation as much as nuclear weapons did which nuclear weapons yes. kind of reconfigured the globe for a century right 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 so i wouldn't worry about the great reset i would worry about wh whoever come whoever gets to ai first if it's china if it's north korea god forbid <laughs> oh my god well isn't i mean i would imagine people would say that they're going to like AI would be part of the Great Reset. You know, they're going to use AI to implement some crazy things via the Great Reset I, or the, via AI. The thing is, though, and I mean, I took a bunch of notes here for you know maybe we should get into the video first, but the, the yeah, stuff, we can get into it. the stuff in the report is just, I mean, the stuff that they're asking for in the report. Mm -hmm. I find it hard to believe that you guys wouldn't want these things. <laughs> like what? Okay, so in the in the very well, actually, I don't remember if this is in the beginning of the robot reporter. waifu. Are we gonna get the robot waifus? In the, I'm on board with no, the great reset if we get our robot. No waifus, robot waifus, and I did okay, look for I'm that. Out. I'm out. <laughs> fuck Swab. Fuck Wef. Fuck the the great reset. I'm out. There is an entire section on the technological reset and how. Uh, you know, COVID has pushed us more towards automation, which mm -hmm. I mean, all the shit in there is kind of true. They even did a, a good job predicting the Russia Ukraine thing. They were like, you know, petrol state, uh, a petro state could get in a situation where they're 
uh, their in a resource crunch and start wars. I was like, oh wow, mm-hmm. fucking nailed it there, didn't they? <laughs> so mm-hmm. in the uh, so this says in in June 2020, barely six months uh, since the pandemic started, the world is in a different place. Within this short time frame, COVID 19 has both triggered momentous change and magnified the fault lines that already uh, beset our economies and society. Okay, so here are the fault lines that they lay out that they're trying to deal with. Rising inequality, a widespread sense of unfairness, deepening Mm -hmm. geopolitical divides, political polarization, rising public deficits and high levels of debt, ineffective or non-existent global governance. Okay, that one probably scares people. Um, uh, Excessive financialization, which means, Mm -hmm. you know, making money off of having money, not producing anything. And environmental and environmental degradation. Now, aside, I mean, I, you could make an argument that, well, the the thing that scares people is the global governance part of it. But I would say we have ineffective or non-existent national governance as well like right now we're in a fucking mess well <laughs> we're fucking the do- the doddering old man wandering around the white house but isn't like these things i mean when was this book written that you read this yeah. this was written six months into the pandemic june okay so june this was well, not predicting anything this is just talking about what happened right like this what, is, what we're this witnessing is, the thing, this is the thing that they talk about in this debate that James Lindsay gets all bent out of shape because mm-hmm. Destiny has not read this thing, right? And the so it was written about how COVID nineteen is going to is creating an opportunity for massive, you know, global change. But all the problems that they lay out are problems that I think are, I mean, these are real problems, right? Yes. Are you against they rising are, yeah. inequality? Well, the, the, I guess it sounds like the widespread issue is like, sense of unfairness. Sitch, are you right. uh, in or out? But it's like, but simply being able to point to accurate problems or, or make accurate criticisms to me is not indicative of anything. I mean, the Marxists can point to a lot of problems in society. That doesn't mean that solutions necessarily are correct. Right, but the solutions, I mean, they're they're not really laying out solutions in the report. They're just kind of. Oh, okay. Interesting. Well, maybe yeah. that's maybe that's in one of his other books that gets James's heckles up is where he lays. Well, that's out what his I was. Lo- I'm like, where's the eat the bugs shit? Where's the eat, <laughs> where's the eat the bugs? Where's the eat the bugs? Where's the nobody ha- gets private property business? Where's all well, that? I at? saw that the um, I don't know where the eat the bugs thing came from. I think it's kind of a meme, but the whole you'll own nothing and be happy. Yeah, where's like, that come from? That was from some because I looked that up. That was some like 2016 Danish. MP or something. It's made not this even comment Carl Schwab about, or, or maybe Schwab. Schwab. I don't know if Schwab ever Schwab, took it up. Klaus Schwab. That's it. Klaus. 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 But um, no, it was some like Danish MP made the comment, and it was about how they were theorizing that the future would be like everything is rent oriented. Like you don't own property; everything is rent based from like app based, which I think is really stupid and not remotely what the future would look like, but. Well, there's none of this in the Great Reset stuff, so. Okay. Well, I think it all gets kind of conflated together in a giant pile, sort of, when people talk about it. And we we did a bunch of reading on the ESG stuff. Formally socially responsible investing, SRI. <laughs> Someone says it's a W. WEF has a video on this. You'll own nothing. Maybe let's see. Because that'd be kind of interesting. So some other YouTuber. No, no, no. The World Economic Forum. Okay. Uh, YouTube page. Oh, I, I think I watched that video. Yeah, that that video is, I guess, kind of insane. Oh, they have, so they do have a video about you own nothing or whatever? Right. Um, well, I don't know about World that. World Economic own nothing. Let's get into the video. There's new people here. One of the things that advocacy, like the EPA and peace, the, that actually does have at least some connection to the president and somebody voting is going is getting replaced with ESGs. So there's the ESG products you can have like environmental, social, global scores for mm-hmm. corporations. You may um, if you don't have a high mark on these, you could be cut out of lending. Um, and you could be forced to do 
whatever ESGs are doing. So do you feel so he he perceives the ESG score as like a social credit score that if you don't attain a certain level you're going to be basically ostracized from society, which is just completely, that's not the situation remotely. Well, I'm not, he says, he says, if you don't have an ESG score high enough, you can't get it alone. Right. Um, I'm not familiar with that. That's yeah. at all from my research of ESG scores that we were doing this week. Yes. I mean, like, if someone knows in the chat knows what that's refer referring to, then let me know. I mean, my understanding is that ESG scores are sort of this. I mean, we both came to the conclusion that they're a scam, essentially. Yeah, yeah. Um, they're but marketing. That it's just, yeah, it's it's basically, and we'll probably get into it more because I want to let the video play for a little more. It's kind of like, you know, when you go to the supermarket and it says everything is labeled organic. All natural. Yeah, all natural, organic. And you're like, I don't know what any of these fucking labels mean, but, you know, people buy them because of that. That's what I think ESG scores are now. Well, and, and in the context of the conversation we're having about regulation, mm -hmm. it feels like maybe the companies are using this as a double scam t to throw off regulators as well. Like, you don't have to yes. regulate us for climate change. Look, we're already regulating ourselves. We came up with this thing called the ESG, and it's kind mm -hmm. of like the movie industry decided, you know, they had to regulate themselves to avoid government regulation, and they came up with the movie rating system. Uh, World Bank loans, I believe. Hmm. Are World Bank loans based on ESG? I don't know. I don't know. Feel that this is cutting out some of the defenses that you said were there. I, I mean, I don't. I, I doubt we would ever implement something like that. I, I like people talk about it a lot, but I mean, I brought this up earlier in a panel. Like, all of Europe will uniformly condemn Russia for their actions, but they won't stop buying their gas. I don't think that a any individual country is about to sign. There's a reason why so many of these like global climate accords that everybody gets so mad about end up being non-binding with no enforcement mechanisms. It's because the the result of actually enforcing these types of you call them ESG scores, whatever, would probably be pretty catastrophic to trade for a lot of these companies um, and a lot of these countries. And at the end of the day, the people that would get hurt the most by that are probably going to be working class or poor people. But what if all the companies decide to do it? So there are, um, and maybe this, is what he's re maybe this is what he's referencing. There are, well, is it actually happening or does, or people want it? There are people who want financial institutions to only loan money to businesses with high ESG scores. Right. Those there are people are, that want that to happen. Sure, okay. Um, so I, I'm not I, sure that it's happening yet. So I'm a shareholder of J.P. Morgan, and I want to feel good when I go to sleep at night knowing that J.P. Morgan is not lending money to dirty, dirty oil companies. Right. So therefore, J.P. Morgan is going to make they're going to make a deal saying we will only loan money, but it's still just advertising. We went. I mean, our do you want to blow our wad on fucking ESG? I mean, we went through all that shit. Well, I think a more, and, and when I read some people complaining about ESG stuff, I think a more nuanced and, and accurate picture of the problem with the loaning situation is that there are a lot of government programs and a lot of government loans that are based around green energy and, you know, uh, environmental sustainability and all this other stuff. And, some people, I guess, want to use ESG score as like the metric for these uh, government loans or for these green loans and all this other stuff. And I think that's a big problem because I think problem. ESG scores are essentially a scam, essentially. And I think that the environmental aspect of them is a super big scam, which we'll get into a little later. So, And you have companies with conflicting ESG scores, like some of the companies rate a company at like five and some rate them at a hundred. So obviously right, someone's yeah. getting some money under the table or something. Right. Well, part, yeah. So another big problem with ESG scores is that it's not, you know, the government's not giving you an ESG score. There's not some, or there's no central authority that gives you an ESG score. There's a, there's a various private companies that have different metrics. Right. And it's all kind of nebulous. And they also, you have a bunch of different rating agencies for these ESG scores and none of it's regulated. None of it's standardized. 
So as you said, you could have one company get the bad ESG score from from one private company, so they go to a different private company, and that private company gives them a good ESG score. Yeah, you know. exactly. They say, listen, we got this shitty e- – look, I'm, we're Exxon Mobil, okay? We just had right. a fucking pipe blow up in the Gulf of Mexico and spew oil <laughs> for fucking – three months okay <laughs> right right but we need we need to get this esg score thing worked out okay work with us here what can we do mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah so fuck like what if the bulk of the companies if 90 percent of companies decide to do a csg is pretty enforceable uh, I mean, then it's going to depend on what the score is rated for, I guess, or what kind of score we're talking about. Um, like, for instance, like, you know, when we talk about, like, making healthier food for um, for kids, I know that the Department of Education, I think, had standards for, like, what your food had to be to be able to be sold in cafeterias. Like, if people are meeting those types of standards, I don't think there's necessarily anything wrong with that. But it's going to come down to the individual regulation we're talking about. Something like climate change is probably going to be a lot more contentious because that's seen as a way more politicized issue than... What's you your guys' take on ESGs? So... We're not talking about policy. No, we're talking about corporate investment strategies. And so the enforcement mechanism isn't necessarily through governments. They sign on. The SEC is now backing, for example, um, the, the ESG model for, for ETFs, for, for grading uh, tr- securities and other things you might trade, stocks, et cetera. But what we're actually talking about... So... <laughs> that's kind of meaningless, isn't it? Well, it's not meaningless. What he said is, if, if what he said was true, that'd be a huge deal. Because essentially he's saying the SEC, SEC, which right. is supposed to Securities regulate. Securities and you know, Exchange Commission. Right, which is the government organization that regulates you know, these financial if you institutions. Get, if you buy a stock and it turns out that no company existed and you were totally scammed, that's the company you're going to turn to, the Securities right. and Exchange Commission. And if the SEC basically adopted ESG, um, that would be a big deal. And I think that would be really bad. He just said that they did adopt it, didn't he? Right. That's not exactly what happened. Right. So there's a couple things that have happened. The first is investors have been have been crying because ESG is kind of a scam. And as I said, that there's no real standard criteria criteria to any of this stuff. Um, investors have been crying out, and businesses have been crying out for ESG ratings to be regulated. Right. Because My they're like, I'm tired of buying stocks and feeling like I'm getting a good night's sleep and really someone's lying to me. Right. My understanding is that uh, credit agencies that like that will rate, you know, whether something is a secure investment, you know, AAA or AA or whatever, that all that stuff is standardized and regula- and regulated by the SEC to some extent. Now, obviously, they fucked up substantially with the housing crash. So right. you could say yeah. the regulation failed in that regard. But you know, everyone's operating under supposed to be operating some, under the same rules, same principles. That's not the case with these environmental, social, governance scores. There is no. I don't believe there's any current regulation on any of that stuff. It's like the law was currently. Right. And so, so both investors and businesses want there to be some standardized framework that the SEC lays out and says, okay, you you can have these scores. Uh, if you want, but they have to be standardized. And so an example that would be like the, I think the organic food is a perfect example. The government doesn't tell food companies that they should create this organic label and that they should start labeling their food organic. A bunch of food companies say, hey, people, a bunch of hippies out here, Mm -hmm. you know, want to buy food that, you know, they think is either free range or doesn't have herbicides or pesticides or is not genetically modified so we're going to stick this label organic on it, and we're going to trick people into thinking that it's free-range non, uh, you know, free-range meat that hasn't been given any hormones or anything like that. And then you look into it, and it's like, you know, generally, that's not really what the organic label means or whatever. You know, it could mean anything. And it's all great, kind of a marketing scam. They have a great way of doing this. Like they basically label their factory farm. They change the name to Free Range. So they're like, yeah, these are all free range chickens now, even though right. nothing has changed. They're still yes, in their tiny right. little coops. Right. But technically, they can call it free range. Right. So then consumers and then businesses that are in competition, they cry out to the government and say, okay, you know, you need to regulate for consumer protection purposes and also for, you know, for making business uh, comp- competition fair. You need to regulate some label like organic or whatever. 
So that actually means something. Right. That it actually, so if you buy something that's organic, it actually means what people think it means. And so the government maybe decides to or not to make a decision on whether they're going to do that. And the ESG score seemed to be sort of the same thing. The government's not over here saying everyone, someone needs to have the ESG score. It's just that all these private uh, investment firms and all these uh, you know, private equity funds and all this other garbage have decided on their own that they're going to start doing this ESG garbage. And now it's become such a scam that they're basically crying to the government to regulate the scam and saying, okay, we're all kind of in the swamp and we need you to kind of be referee here at this moment. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that the government did actually, when it came to the environment, the government did actually lay out, and I think it's what James is referring to, the government did um, lay out new rules that it wants certain companies, I forget how big they have to be, but it wants certain companies to uh, have to start saying, they have to start giving out some information about their environmental impact and their predicted future environmental impact. And there is some overlap between that and what the ESG score is supposed to measure. And I think that's where the conflation is coming to, but I don't think that's, it's not the same thing. Right. I saw this thing on high fructose corn syrup that they were going to allow manufacturers to label it on the label as sugar. Mm -hmm. And I was like, what the fuck? Really? That's really bad. (laughs) That's terrible. So many people, they've just, so the companies have discovered you know, nobody's buying our shit because it has high fructose corn syrup in it. So the government just, right. they basically lobby the government to say, hey, can we not really call it high? Can we just call it sugar? I mean, <laughs> basically is sugar, right? Right. Though obviously it's uh, believed to be like the most unhealthy type of sugar. So. I was trying, I don't know if it passed or not that yet. I was trying to look it up. I, I would be, Hidden I mean, that'd be crazy. Science, sugar science. Nothing would say high fructose syrup anymore because everyone's so anti high fructose. How corn high syrup fructose right corn syrup is being marked as sugar? Mm-hmm. What is this? I don't know if it's in America, but anyway. So this is a kind kind of this is a kind of scams that business will do that screams out for government regulation. Whether right, or not the government right. regulates is an open question. And with ESG scores right now, there has been no regulation. No regulation right. whatsoever. So, which makes this conversation very interesting. We haven't got to it yet, but I can't wait to. When people start saying, this is fascist. The largest banks in the world, including the central banks, have decided that ESGs are going to be, if you have a high score, according to what their corporate boards have decided, are sound environmental policy. Again, this is people like, we can name individuals like Bill Gates, Larry Fink. I mean, we can name single individuals, very small numbers of them. They get to set what gives you a high score, and that determines whether or not you get investment capital. That determines whether or not you qualify for, for loans. That, that there, Bill Gates is not, I did, in none of my reading did I come across Bill Gates having anything to do with setting these ESG scores. So I don't know what he's talking about there. Mm-hmm. Or, or startup idea. capital. Uh, it, will determine whether or not, for example, BlackRock will carry your stock. So all of a sudden, BlackRock, which might have bought up already using other people's money, by the way, a 20 per, which you're the stakeholder, but they're doing it for you. Uh, that's how that works. It's your money, but now they have a 20% controlling interest in some company, and they come and they tell the company, well, you need to do this. And the company says, well, you know, piss off. And they're like, well, we won't give you investment capital. Like, we'll find it somewhere else. And they'll say, well, we'll sell our 20% share in your stock and just watch your company tank. On- this is exactly what happened with Elon Musk and Twitter. It's so bizarre that this is, I mean, mm-hmm. this is like, yeah, this is how it works. But he's pitching it like it's bad. Well, Dude, well, Elon, well, Elon well. Musk bought a 9% stake in Twitter. <laughs> Look, yes, yes. Elon Musk bought a 9% stake in Twitter so mm-hmm. he would have leverage when he wanted to buy the company. Okay. So, I mean, this, yeah. Well, okay. What, what he's saying, and what he's saying is true, and I do think it is a problem in that there is this, uh, I guess it's a firm called BlackRock, which has some extraordinary amount of, of investment capital. Yeah. And some extraordinary amount of the percentage of the market in certain certain markets is controlled by BlackRock. And uh, BlackRock's CEO, Larry Fink, has been very, very vocal and very big on pushing ESG scores. 
Now, I interpret this. So I guess we have to get into it now. I interpret the ESG scores as a scam because one of the biggest ESG rating agencies, which BlackRock works in conjunction with, is called MSCI. And there's some, conf- this is where I think it's a shell game. People assume that the ESG score means like, oh, if you have a high ESG score, that means you're a woke company or you're an environmentally friendly company or something. That's how people interpret it. That's not really what the score means. MSCI says that, that the environmental score doesn't mean, or the environmental aspect of the ESG score, because there's three things that are being measured, um, that the environmental aspect of the score doesn't measure how green a company is. It measures how likely a company's profits will be impacted by environmental policies put out by the government. Okay. okay. That's a complete yeah, that's a completely different thing. That's a shell game. Say that, it's very say that one more time. So the 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 E score, the E, the environmental score and the ESG score under MSCI is which how is one regulation of the, will affect your bottom line. Right. It's not, it's not measuring how green a company is. Right. It's measuring <laughs> how much impact a company's profits will be hit by the environmental policies of the government that the company, you know, organization is located in. That's, that's okay. calling high fructose syrup sugar <laughs> right. shit right there. So basically what that means would be if a company, you could have one company that is not pumping sludge into a nearby lake. And it has a score of A+. Plus. I know it's not the score, but just for the example. So like an A plus score, not, not pumping sludge into the lake. You have another company that is pumping sludge uh, not into a local lake, but is shipping that sludge to be pumped into a lake somewhere across the world, like Lauren was talking about. Okay, You know, they're dumping their trash in some third world country. They would also be rated an A+. Plus. Because they're st- they're not being impacted by the government policies, even though they're still polluting. Right, because they're doing it in okay. a country that doesn't have any regulation on them. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And they're so, smart. <laughs> right, and so that's why this whole thing seems like a scam to me. Because it's not even, it's not even saying that the companies are green. It's just saying that the companies aren't going to be impacted by whatever laws the government is is pushing right, right now. Um, and so. Well, and so, the, I mean, I don't know, the whole, this, but this is part of my problem with the conceptualization of this, too. I, since the ESG scores do seem like a scam to me. Oh, and there's another issue, too, which is that, and I, and I put this on Twitter, so, so what's weird about this. When I looked at MSCI's website, they have, they, they have Tesla, so the company that's trying to make electric cars, and they give them the same environmental impact rating as Shell Oil. <laughs> okay. The company that's pumping, you know, gas into the atmosphere. And they even have on MSC, MSCI's website, it has something like, you know, Shell Oil is pumping, you know, 800 megatons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere every year or something. And it has, you know, Tesla's pumping 20 or something, I assume via factories or whatever. And you're like, you look at that chart and you're like, how the fuck are these labeled the same based on their environmental score? Well, it's because it's not measuring how green the company is. It's measuring how much their profitability is going to be hurt by government regulations, which is a very different metric. Yeah. Usually but so different. this, but this makes me skeptical sort of, of the claim that James is laying out because James is kind of looking at ESG scores as this is a, con- this is a conspiracy to have companies like BlackRock and the WEF, you know, basically control these companies to implement like their neo-Marxian future. But then I say, but wait a minute, if the scores are a scam and they don't actually measure the thing they're supposed to measure, I mean, does BlackRock not know that? He ha- BlackRock has to know that. I'm assuming he's not a fucking moron. And I'm yeah. a, so I start to think the reason BlackRock is pushing the ESG scores is not because they actually believe in any of this ideology. It's all profit motive. It's exactly. all, as Scott Adams says, follow the money. BlackRock has made a business model of claiming that they're the organic, you know, the organic investors, 
that they're only going to invest in, you know, socially conscious companies because that's what people care about right now. And so they sort of bully everyone into this, you know, because because BlackRock has sort of dominated the market under this ESG label, then they can sort of bully everyone into doing what they want to do. Yeah, it's a power grab, definitely. Right. But it's a ca power grab under good old fashioned capitalism. Well, that's the thing. It seems like it's all a power grab for money under the thin veneer of social justice and social consciousness. Right. Yeah. And I th and I think James is saying he thinks that he thinks the veneer is real. Right. And I guess I I don't think it is. I think the veneer is fake. Yeah, I think the veneer is very fake. Yeah. I'm at so BlackRock is this company, but it's all over the place. Is this managing the net zero transition? That's net zero carbon emissions, right? That's just shorthand mm -hmm. for climate change. Right. Yeah. Also, I mean, this is kind of the rise of the retail investor too. A lot of these trading platforms, you know, it, it used to be 20, 30 years ago, if you were going to trade stocks, you had a stock broker and, you know, you called them up and told them what you wanted to buy and that kind of stuff. Now people can manage their own portfolios and do uh, a lot better than dealing with some third party that's going to, you know, maybe sell you some scam stocks or whatever. So mm -hmm. I think with the, with the retail investing market being such a huge deal and people not wanting to, to invest in, you know, what they perceive as dirty companies, this is kind of a marketing thing that had to come along. Because right, the money can right, move around right. too easily now. Yeah, no, you're you're completely correct. And I think, you know, maybe that's what BlackRock, you know, from a greedy financial perspective, which is what I'm assuming their motivation is. Maybe that's what they're they're looking at. They're saying, oh, you know, people are going to start pulling out their money and investing, you know, privately. So we have to kind of get on the ball here and jump ahead of this. Right. under this ESG score scam. Right. Which now I do think that the ESG score can lead to negative behaviors from companies. I don't think that's a conspiracy because there is well first of all it's really stupid to take something like your environmental impact, you know, your social score whatever that means and your governance score which is like, you know, how your business is run. And combine, you can't combine all these things together to create a single score. That's insane. These are very different issues. And it leads to bizarre situations where you can have companies that, you know, maybe they pollute a lot, but, you know, they hire a lot of, you know, uh, oppressed minorities, right? They put a bunch of oppressed, you know, minorities and LGBTQ plus A helicopters onto various leadership positions to kind of raise the score where maybe their environmental impact would be really shitty or something so that it averages out and they get a good score. And just terrible. Right. And I think that's what James is sort of focusing on. And I think this is, maybe this is what's going on. I think James is looking for like the smoking, the magic bullet here, the smoking gun about why corporations have become so woke in the last five to six years. And he thinks it is because of these ESG scores. And I think, I mean, he could be right, but it's kind of like a chicken and egg thing. It's hard for me to determine, you know, is it the ESG scores and the fact that you can kind of do woke shit to buff your score? Is that what is pushing companies in that direction? Or were companies already kind of woke because of the culture and now so they're adopting the ESG scores? Yeah, I think they're following the culture. I've heard a lot of people talk about these ESG scores, but I never really dug in until this came up. People have also been wanting us to talk about the Great Reset stuff, so this is a good mm -hmm. combo. But I, I'm with you. I mean, I just I I think it's just a scam. <laughs> it is uh, fascism is the name for this, and I, I think we can get some strong agreement that this is the, the model of fascism. And in fact, they call it a public-private partnership, so they don't have to call it fascism because people would probably be alarmed if they called it fascism directly. Okay, so I, none of this has anything to do with fascism. I don't know why the word is invoked. Also, I, I think that this entire conversation betrays like a huge misunderstanding of the efficiency of capital markets. Hey, see, that's why I don't understand because he he said he said it's not the government doing this, but then he says it is a public-private partnership. So I don't. I'm very confused as to how he's labeling this under fascism, I and mean, he doesn't really explain it very well. So we get to read between the lines, which is always fun. 
I guess. To the United <laughs> States and across the world. Can I break um, up the, for uh, one second? How many of Klaus Schwab's books have you read? Because I read absolutely all of them. none of them. Can, give me a definition <laughs> of fascism that would be incorporated in this. It's the fusion of public and private. See, this is oh, this is like Adam friended first debate rookie move right here. How many books <laughs> have you read? I wasn't that bad. Okay, I I basically said here's the source that I'm citing and throughout the book. I didn't say. Well, have you read this book? If you haven't read this book, you're not eligible to be in this conversation well, okay. right now. I don't think there's anything wrong with saying how many books have you read on the subject. The the issue now, I don't know how it's perceived. We'll have to ask the chat. You know, is it is it look good for James to say how many books have you read? You know, I think the issue is that Destiny asked how is this related to fascism. And so saying, well, how many books have you read by Klaus Schwab? That's not really answering the question. Like if Destiny was saying, I don't think Klaus Schwab is acting in this way, blah, 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 blah. Then James can throw in with the, well, how many books have you read? You know, thing. Is right. that fair? Yeah. Is that fair? You're always the fair one. I'm like, I try to be fair. I'm here to dunk on people. Okay. <laughs> it's just so funny. James is such a mixed bag. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean by that? Well, I listened to his that groomer talk he did with Deborah So. Mm -hmm. So good. <laughs> like, so good. Yeah. Well, I think the issue, and I've said this a million times. But this, is I'm that like, fuck. <laughs> it, it goes back to the lens thing. I think James has constructed a very useful lens for interpreting and going over uh, this kind of neo Marxian material. And I think you get into trouble when you use that lens to interpret everything. And I don't think everything can be interpreted through that same lens. I agree. It's, it's not 20 individual bad actors. It's not the World Economic Forum itself that are planning this all. And I think that's a problem of the right and how they've presented the Great Reset and that conversation. If you actually look at Klaus Schwab's book, a lot of what he's talking about in the Great Reset is things that are already moving forward in countries and corporations, policies already in place that they want to promote and excel and they want to work with governments to excel that, what they can invest in, conferences they can start, things they can lobby and influence. So it's not just these shadowy figures behind the World Economic right. Forum pulling think, every string. It's a lot of, it's a, it's a shift that they're going to use COVID and the pandemic to push forward even quicker. Yeah, but a lot of these ideas are marketable. Like, so even before, or maybe you think this is all great reset people, I don't know. Like, w one thing that companies learned over the past like 10 or 15 years is that if you sell like your packaging is environmentally friendly, you say that your beans come from like highly paid workers or whatever, as dumb as this might seem to some people, these are effective marketing strategies where even selling like a higher cost of your final good or service can actually have people coming into your store to buy stuff. Yeah, so the question is, is like, are there really like a shadowy group of people that are like leading the change or are like customers just a little bit more environmentally conscientious and they want to buy They'll pay a little bit more if they can feel better about buying some green, you know, carton of, that's of like milk. That's like a good of. example you can find that's on your side. But there's plenty of bad examples that aren't good for certainly small companies. I, I think what Lauren said before Destiny responded was really good. And I think she's trying to correct the framing here. Yeah, I agree. Um, and I think what Destiny said is true. And I think the ar this is the argument I think James should be laying out, which is that, yes... Now, obviously, I'm biased because this is my opinion, but or this is let's just say this is the argument I would lay out. Okay, yes, the ESG scores are not necessarily controlled by a shadowy cabal of people who want to enact neo-Marxist agenda, regardless of you know maybe that's what Klaus Schwab wants, but I don't think that's what BlackRock and Wall Street wants. I think what BlackRock and Wall Street want is to have performative virtue signaling, and or it's the same thing as putting organic label on your food in order to trick customers into thinking they're doing some kind of social good by buying stock in Shell Oil <laughs> or something to that. Now, the problem with that, which I think James could hone in on, is kind of what we've talked about where when it comes to the revolution, people are LARPing the revolution until suddenly they're not, until suddenly it's real. And I think the problem with this performative wokeness stuff is, as I said earlier, the performative wokeness provides cover for real wokeness. It, it confuses politicians and it confuses the public 
into thinking that wokeness is a bigger thing than it is. And it allows from a political level, real detrimental, terrible woke policies to start seeping into our government. And that's the problem with the performer of wokeness. That's the problem with ESG scores. Even if the motivations of the people behind it are fake, it can still lead to creating this negative situation that I don't that even they don't want and they don't realize that they're creating. Right. Well, do you, I mean so, sooner or later we need sustainability. I mean, moving in that direction, I think performative wokeness aside. Right, but that's what's well, a different issue. I mean, has to, right. A like, different issue is that the ESG scores since they're fucking scam, it doesn't actually address doesn't the real address environmental, real yeah. sustainable issues, the real income inequality issues that we would like it to focus on. And it right. kind of draws energy away from it. And I'm assuming that's what Peter Coffin or someone like that would say. That's why he's against this stuff too, because he thinks it's all just a front. All that social pressure is going to waste. Like the whole idea is right. you want to harness this social pressure for actual tangible good in the world. But it's being circumvented by the fact that this is just a marketing campaign. This is right, exactly, sustainable exactly. and name only. Right. Yeah. So, but right. none of this, I mean, none of this relates back to the more interesting claim that this is all fascism. <laughs> Which, <laughs> I just like, okay. <laughs> well, I think James can make the argument. And I, and I don't know if he believes this or if he doesn't. I don't know what he believes. But I think he can make the argument that BlackRock and corporations basically LARPing wokeness could lead to fascism. They could. I think you can LARP your way into fascism by accident. Oh, hell yeah. So maybe that's the argument that he should be making. Right. But right now right. I just feel like the argument is banker's bad. Yeah, yeah, right and the people as well. You look at what's going on in the UK right now, they're directly using the pandemic as an excuse to shut down a lot of small farms, saying you can't have chickens outside. No more free-range chickens. They're banning that right now in the UK. And you have to follow extremely high biometric policies that just the average small farm can't afford, which is obviously helping big business, reducing the amount of free-range eggs, which generally people want, but they're all doing it under the guise of disease. We want to stop disease. And that's an instant market shift, power to larger corporations that can afford to make these changes. S smaller companies, even household chickens, can't own them anymore. I mean, that's going to be the case. If you, if you have problems with capitalism or corporations, that's not because capitalism. It, it, it is always going to be the case that larger I, I firms... I think it's capitalism. It's always it's going capitalism to capitalism for the government to come in and tell you you can't own chickens anymore? It's going to be capitalism that any... I think the state any, works in the capital interest, yeah. As the any, restriction, any restriction that you place is always I mean, going to be is. met easier by larger corporations. That's just that's the nature of the economy of scale. That's what happens when firms grow in size. That's why every time there's any government incentive program, any government regulation or restriction, people will always point out, well, hey, this is more harmful to big businesses than larger businesses. Yeah, of course, because larger businesses can always function better in any environment with any regulation because they're able to meet and exceed those standards. So I'm, I'm glad they, we it, agree that the government are shifting a bunch of power to well, large but the corporations. The problem is, is it, is it, it, no, it's a natural shift that will happen. Yeah, it's a natural shift that the World Economic Forum and a lot of uh, lobbyists are promoting. Right. Okay. And by the, the way, you should go to the World Economic Forum website and look up their list of partners. It's literally most of the thousand largest co corporations in the world are their yeah. list of committed partners. And if you watch any of the, the World Economic Forum um, you know, meetings, they start out with basically what's like a, a commitment to our forward-looking vision where they all, it's very ritualistic looking in a, in a kind of weirdly corporate sense, where they're, they're saying we all commit to you know, creating this better world. And the, I'm telling you, like literally most of the thousand largest corporations in in the world have signed on to this program where klaus i mean he sounds like bernie sanders to me here he really does <laughs> who does klaus or james james oh, i mean okay. the thing he's talking about the problem is the big corporations the big corporations this is saying as, as lauren rightly pointed out klaus is saying there is there is these changes coming to the world the, the rapidity the velocity blah 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 you know the complexity and so what we need the, the whole narrative, and his newest book is called The Great Narrative, as a matter of fact. He's honestly. so honest, I appreciate he, he, it. He really is. <laughs> so he, his, the whole point is this, is that the world's changing very rapidly. There are all these diseases we've got to be scared of. There's the possibilities of synthetic biology that we have to be scared of. There's, things are changing so quickly because of AI and because of technology and social media, et cetera, that what we need is a group of people 
to cooperate to usher us through this. And who needs to lead that is the relevant experts leading uh, one way or another by bringing together government, foundation, and uh, corporation in order to work in a kind of harmonized way that he's calling a public-private partnership. His goal, he explained. Well, I just, I, the, I started this stream by saying AI is something that we should be aware of. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, the nuclear situation that happened, what, 60, 70 years ago is, is a similar situation. I mean, during World War II, there was a, a race to get to nuclear weapons. I would right. like to know that there were people who were paying attention to that stuff that did have, were knowledgeable <laughs> in this kind of field. So I, I don't necessarily know what he's pitching here. Is he saying that, no, we should just not pay attention to those things? Should should we not have had a Manhattan Project well, to get nuclear weapons before the Nazis did? I feel like that's a bad way to go. He, he's not, well, first of all, what he just laid out, that would make more sense with him calling this fascism, I guess, from earlier. Because he is talking about this government foundation, private, you know, partnership of central, it was like version of centralized planning or whatever, or planned economies or whatever word you want to use for it. I guess that would align more with fascism than what he said earlier. Um, but I guess under what you're saying, Adam, maybe part of the problem is that he's not, I, he's just talk, he's just describing Klaus's vision, I guess. He's not saying what he thinks should be the alternative. Well, Klaus doesn't even really lay out a vision. Klaus says, this is the state of the world and how things are going to be changing. And we need to be prepared for that as, as business people. Well, I'm assuming Klaus lays it out in other books of his. Okay. Cause I mean, he's written a bunch of books on this stuff. And I mean, the, the WEF is all about, I thought is all about, you know, trying to create prescriptive economic social policy. So there is a vision there. Well, he, I mean, people sent me, we haven't watched it yet. People sent me, you know, the, you're going to own nothing and be happy video that we can watch at some point. But yeah, the, that's kind of what I was hoping for in the, in the, in the book. reset thing, mm -hmm. but it's not really, <laughs> it's not really in there, but they're the, I read you the list of things that they're, they want to, that they're saying are problems for society that need to be dealt with in some way, shape, or form. Rising inequality, widespread sense of unfairness, uh, deepening geopolitical divides, political polarization. I mean, these are things we're all worried about. Right, right. I mean, we have, is, is your America's big fat debt in the chat today? Because rising public deficits and high levels of debt are on the list. <laughs> mm -hmm. So... Right, but the, the question again is, we can all look at problems and we can all critique problems and that's all good and fine. It's what is the solution that's being advocated for? And if the WF or Klaus is advocating for some weirdo, you know, Marxism thing, which it seems like that's what they're advocating for. Well, in the context of a debate, though, I would like to know what James Lindsay is advocating for. Yeah, what does he want? it wants, kind right. of sounds like he's saying this will work itself out and we should just run from anybody who has any power ever. It's like, well, I don't necessarily know if that's a good idea, man. I think there's a problem with, and, and maybe we've been acute. Maybe this is part of the problem with people when they hear us talk about things is that if, if James is just criticizing the stakeholder model and the WEF model, people would then assume, oh, well, he thinks that whatever the, the previous status quo was is fine, which is shareholder capitalism. But I would assume James doesn't like that he either. Does, but this is why I'm bringing this so, up, because the whole ramble on Occupy Wall Street is anti-shareholder Right. Model. So, yeah, I don't know what he's advocating for exactly. Yeah. So it sounds like he's just saying all of this is terrible. Well, we got to have something. What the right. Fuck? Well, I mean, to be fair, you know, these, I mean, I think you can come and say that this thing is awful and terrible without saying what, I mean, maybe he's, maybe he'll say, I don't know. I think he does actually at some point say he's not knowledgeable enough to know what is the solution. He's just trying to alert people to this problem, right. which I think is a fair thing to do. Yeah. But
Sure. I understand that there is problems with centralizing this much stuff yes. around certain like uh, corporations, but you don't need a shadowy government twenty right. people I to do it. Agree. You just I need a bunch of people that want convenience in their lives and technology. Absolutely. Yeah, call us a law. Yeah. 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 I, I think days. the right wing have done themselves a massive disservice by portraying True, this babe. as a conspiracy theory. They Absolutely. talk about it like it's all shadowy. It's not. It's all out in the open. It's all being talked about. Of course, the government and corporations want more power, and of course, a lot of them think they are the good guys. In order to predict black swan events, we have to have control over our society in order to, you know, better outcomes. We need to be able to track everyone so we can do contract tracing. If there's a worse disease that outbreaks, we need to have digital ID. We need to bring in all of these things for the good of the people, right? But then one of the last chapters in Klaus Schwab's book is what if this becomes a dystopia? And he talks about, oh, this could be abused. This could be misused if it's in a centralized, the hands of a centralized power. And that is what the problem is. Every villain in every good story thinks they're the good guy. Yeah, but you could Thanos argue this could happen, happen in either way, away. right? Like some people are arguing for more centralization and oh no, that's horrible. But you could just as easily argue the other side where people are arguing to decentralize things and that ends up horrible. Look at what happened to... <laughs> Uh, I just realized where I am. Look at what happened with Texas's power grid, right? During the last huge snowstorm shit. They have an, a unique independent market where you have like these different buyers and sellers of energy and because they're incentivized to only function in like a short-term window, their energy market totally fell apart. People were paying like what, like $1,000 to heat their home for one night? Now, you I'm know not why saying that, that happened? I'm not, I'm not saying this their to... Their ESG be, scores are fucking great because yeah, they I'm have windmills. I'm not saying this... They're probably they're not. Pros. But I'm not saying this to... Um, I'm not saying this to say that like free markets are bad or, or centralized power is good. I'm just saying that like you can go too far around either way. We can't just say like unilaterally all forms of centralizing anything are always going to be bad when free market stuff can be bad as well. Like we need no, to be no, a little no. bit more intelligent. But free market stuff is system. harder to abuse. I that's, disagree that with that. absolutely no, no, no. is not true. Corporatism, sure, like massive... I I, I actually think that this is just it is uh, uh, just an acceleration of what we've been on the last 30 years. I don't think that this is something that is new. I don't I think agree. that this is something that we need to look at as like fundamentally different or a big change. I think it's just it's stuff that we've been seeing accruing over years. And I think that comparing it to China isn't necessarily perfect because I think that a lot of these things came out of the incentivized market as, as put forward. Um, I don't think that... Um, I don't necessarily think that planning is an evil thing. I don't think that it is, it is, it is an issue. But I think the issue here is not so much that it is um, planning. I think that it is centralized power over the planning. Whether I think it be that, corporations or, exactly. yeah, or government. And I think that that's the direction that corporations have been heading in for decades. And dec Well, it's always been the direction. But that, that's what the point of them is, is to get more and profit more. Yeah, and Just I agree to bolster your point, by the way, Klaus Schwab published his first book in 1971, so 50 years. <laughs> but Destiny, why, why do we need, doesn't, doesn't shareholder capitalism already account for what you're saying? Like, why do we need stakeholder capitalism? If, because shareholders don't always represent the interests of the public. There could be like really bad you're negative You're worried about behavior. the short term thing, though. So, but the, yeah, but why would... If Pfizer's making dumb moves to make sure they make their quarterly number, and some other good drug company has been investing some kind of long-term thing, but it's trading as a discount and then gets huge because everyone was looking for the quarterly profit. Like, isn't that, isn't that the uh, solution to the short term? Why do we need a, so, ESGs? Can I ask the, this question, right? Because you just said shareholders don't represent the interests of the public. So Bill Gates is shareholder of Microsoft. In fact, is chief of Microsoft. We'll just say shareholder of Microsoft doesn't represent the interests of the public, right? But Bill Gates stakeholder in, say, virus technology represents the interests of the public all of a sudden. How did that shift occur? How does that the work? Individuals don't represent the interests of the public. They usually represent their own interests. Well, well, what would be how... Okay, let's say you need... So I think... I wish Peter had interjected here because I think that's a good question that James just asked, which is the pr part of the problem that they're bringing up with the stakeholder capitalism model is that there is going to be some person or some entity or some group. I mean, you're not going to have a direct democracy for a fucking business decision. That's insane. There's going to be some entity or some group that's supposedly the voice of, you know, the stakeholder. That's supposedly right. the voice of the thing. The and union. So Bill, right. And so if Bill Gates is, you know, how does it make sense if Bill, if you say, well, Bill Gates is a shareholder in Microsoft and, you know, he should set the fuck up because all he does is his own stock. But then suddenly when it comes to like COVID or something related to the pandemic or the viruses, suddenly he's a stakeholder and he's the voice of the country. That is an inherent contradiction and sort of like a lot of the way the system would end up, you know, 
being played out. And I think there is concern to point to this model of shareholderism, not only the fact that it's, you know, a scam, but also if it, you know, if it all relies on a bunch of elite types making sort of these, you know, politically based decisions detached from the markets. I mean, that does seem to be a big problem. It's just, it's interesting to me because like 10 years ago, 20 years ago, it feels like this was what everyone wanted. It feels like everyone was saying, oh, businesses are too greedy. They're too controlled by profits. You know, I wish they were more moral. And now that they're quote unquote more moral, we're like, no, go back to being driven by profit. Right. Yeah. The shift has <laughs> like, happened and everyone's unhappy. Right. It's sort of like everyone, it's sort of like, well, be careful what you wish for. Cause it's like, well, wait a minute. What exactly is the morals that we're talking about? You know, cause we were sort of like 10, 20 years ago operating under this delusion of like, well, you know, when we say we want companies to be more moral, what we mean is according to like a general moral principle that, you know, everyone kind of agrees with, you know, not be, not be greedy, not be shitty. Maybe it's kind of hard to, to, to create an exact framework in writing, but it's kind of like, you know, the, the sort of common sense morals that people like to attribute to that everyone kind of understands or everyone agrees with on a general basis, but then that's not what happens. What happens is now the morals are this kind of like weirdo, far left, wokest garbage. And so now everyone's like, please just go back to being driven by profit. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I don't know what the solution to any of this is. I mean, I don't, you, at some level you have to make decisions and a lot of decisions are made via, you know, expert feedback, even congressional hearings. They are constantly bringing in people who have experience in certain areas. They want their expert opinion. I don't know how you get around the appeal to experts for information. I mean, a yeah, lot but, of these came into being because they were so successful in providing public policy that worked. Yeah, but you don't, we don't, you don't want businesses to be driven by political aims based on "quote unquote" experts. No, I, I completely agree, but that's the businesses issue. are driven by experts. Yeah, but this giving for, feedback like, based on some financial incentive or market incentive. It's not based right. on like. But you know, uh, whatever James seems to be categorically is. against experts giving feedback. Well, I mean, because he's arguing you know, against back it like height. it's the we've end all, of the world. Yeah, we've I, all lost faith in our experts and our in our institutions. Right. Yes. And they, we need to get that all back. And we're not going to get that all back until we can just exercise this neo Marx and gar neo Marxist garbage from our experts and from our institutions well, and from our culture. Really, that's all I'm saying is that. Right the system of you know, getting good information from experts and making decisions based on that that information i don't think yeah, that's it's not a, a bad system, system. yeah right. i don't think it's a system you can just do away with because right. it's been corrupted by these nefarious forces really right. i i just think most of it is political polarization is the problem like people are yes yes they're incapable of giving expert testimony because you know they see trump and they have tds so bad that they're just they're completely this narrative is uh animating them more than the reality of the situation so the expert testimony becomes bad i think that i think you're completely correct but and that's, that's exactly only in happening. situations that are there's like a moral component to it. it's not all situations right but part of the issue here with the esg scores and the wokeness is the moral component you're exactly right well yeah right but and it, it is this sort of like this is why i fucking have a conniption every time i hear some leftist or far right person but generally you know more of the leftist saying everything is political there's no such thing oh, as i hate that political. yeah that's right and it's, that's way. right and that's they're essentially by saying everything's political they're making everything impossible because then everything gets sucked into this tribal political identity lens and, not, and suddenly there's no truth anymore yeah it's fucked up oh i feel like lauren joined the call what's up 
<laughs> just been sitting here chilling. <laughs> How are you oh, don't hey worry now. about me. <laughs> well, you're, you're technically early. Hold on, let me let me finish my thought here on the um so Absolutely. so uh, uh never mind I'm I, f I lost it anyway let me let me bring you up <laughs> you can't you I'm not on camera uh, Lauren Southern has joined the call I'm not on ca uh, camera for you Lauren uh, I'm gonna put you in the show I'm my camera is going into OBS so oh, okay yeah no worries I can't figure out any of that stuff either. That's cool. Don't worry about it. We didn't we so, didn't tease because we didn't know if you were gonna be able to deal with your scheduling conflict. So but welcome. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad I could make it. You're killing it at mom life over here, making it nice. work. Nice. Um I'm so sad. I'm so mad you're watching this debate. Yeah, you're you're <laughs> why, in this why, debate. Wait, why? <laughs> What's wrong? I was so out of my depth in this debate. <laughs> <laughs> like unbelievably oh my gosh i i read klaus schwab's book right mm -hmm. i was preparing for i was kind of preparing for a lot of the social impacts obviously i've spent a lot of time in australia i've seen the changes we've made uh when it comes to travel policy the tracking apps you know digital identity cashless society so i was getting ready to talk about a lot of that mm -hmm. hyper surveillance and then the whole debate ended up being about esgs and economics and like <laughs> I know, I know what I know, I know what I kind of know, and I know what I don't know. And economics is just not my expertise. Right. So I just got to sit there quietly in the corner, like with cheeky banter with James, if you see us whispering to each other throughout mm -hmm. the debate. <laughs> I know there's been a lot of times where like, I'm trying to prepare for some debate or something. I, I, I read up and do all this research on like, what I think it's gonna be about. And then the person shows up and it's about something I know nothing about and don't even care about. And I'm just like, why are we yeah. having this conversation? No. I, so. I, I had at least uh, some level of self-awareness to, I think someone in the chat just mentioned it. They were like, Lauren was pretty quiet the whole debate. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, you know, it's better than going up there and trying to insert yourself in the conversation and just looking silly. So, which I, I think Peter did that a couple of times, but listen. I love that it was just, Peter and James agreeing. <laughs> That's just so weird. Yeah, who would have ever suspected that in a million years? If you're telling me that Peter Coffin and James Lindsay were going to go on stage and just agree with each other against destiny, I that would have blown my mind. But mm -hmm. so we were going to talk a little bit, I think, about a left and right perspective. And and thanks for coming on the show. I guess uh, some of our fans reached out to you and. Uh, it's constantly you berating me. Your fans are next <laughs> level with that. Thing. Destiny's still in the chat talking about coming on for five minutes, and everyone's like, Get him on, please. Destiny can come on for let five him minutes. Come on, let him go on. Let, let Destiny come on for five minutes, Adam. More currency right now. That might change in the future, but I, I just I don't see that being the case right now. A lot would have to change. Sure, like, it, like yeah, they're just, they're not real currencies right Hello, now. They're speculation vehicles that people are using exactly. to try to out speculate. Yeah. Fuck the other. Am I, are we live? We're live, yes. Okay. Don't oh, drop I any just, gamer words. I'm not getting a wording. Okay. I just have to say a couple things. So your chat is say some couple things. App, wait, can I use swear words at least? You can use as many swears as you want. Okay. Don't your chat is driving me insane. Swear on our stream. Okay. Your chat oh, good. Insane. Good. They okay. drive, just, they drive yeah, us okay. all. Just, okay. Capital markets are yeah. so efficient. I can mm -hmm. buy and sell any security anywhere in the fucking world in like two minutes. Okay. Capital markets are insane. The liquidity because of all the market makers and everybody involved is unbelievable. The access to every retailer is unbelievable. All of the institutions like bidding against each other is unbelievable. This idea that 20 people decide like what stocks to buy and sell for your entire fund. Like it doesn't make any sense. People in the chat are saying things like, but destiny, don't you know that you don't actually vote on what the fund manages? You do vote motherfucker. You vote when you buy the fucking fund. Okay. Mm -hmm. When True. you click in your little fidelity account, when you click in the, your Vanguard account and you look at that Y O Y thing, the year over year, all the, the index fund performance and everything, that's what you're buying. You're buying the performance of the fund. That's what you buy on. You, you, mm -hmm. like, so when you say like, well, you don't vote. Yeah, you do vote. Because if I look at my fucking VOO and I see that I'm getting like a 3% return year over year, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to fucking sell it. I'm selling that ETF. I'm not going to hold on to that shit. I'm going to go buy something that outperforms it. Of course you vote. You vote with your wallet, literally, in the most highly liquid way possible. So anybody in chat that's like, well, you don't vote on how to allocate the funds. Yeah, no shit. You're not a fucking asset manager, you dumb fuck. Why? Well, who the fuck would want to buy into a fund where 
uh, morons like you are voting on what things to buy. If you want to vote on things to buy, then you just go and either open your own hedge fund or just buy stocks in it. You can do it on your own. You can buy your own individual stocks. When you're buying a fund, you're buying like a, and these funds aren't even actively managed. The majority of assets held by institutions like Vanguard and they're, and they're funds, not even, yeah. yeah, they're not even actively managed funds. Okay. These, these things don't have people like making crazy buy sell today. It's so stupid. Sorry. Okay. Well, well no, but isn't what, what you're arguing for is, at least it seems like you're arguing for keeping kind of the shareholder capitalism that we have. And it seems like you'd be against the stakeholder model that, that James is also no, arguing here's for. why the stakeholder model is important. Okay. And I can't do, I need to be okay. better at giving big speeches. Okay. Cause I hate it. I just like, I'm autistic. Okay. I just want to go point by point and argue, <laughs> but here's okay. the reality. Okay. There are some companies in the United States that are incredibly uh-huh. successful and amazingly innovative in the tech world. But I don't feel like as an American, I don't feel like the average person gets anything from that. Do we really feel like we share in Zuckerberg's success or Elon Musk's success? It doesn't feel that way. When we landed on the moon in 69, that felt like an American win. Okay. When tech mm-hmm. companies, you know, double their valuation, you know, fucking every five years or whatever, that feels like a win for Bezos and Zuckerberg. It doesn't feel like we're sharing in that win there. So there's got there's gotta be some way to tie us into the success of those companies, whether it's with like a sovereign wealth fund or whatever, like Norway does. I hate wealth taxes, but something maybe there. There has to be some way to get us because like shareholders are, are, are people that are usually have a lot of money, right? Very capital intensive. They make a lot of money. They have a lot of money and that money makes a lot of money. So they have more money so they can make more money. And I, I just don't feel like the average Americans are really bought into the success of the average shareholder of, you know, a multi-billion dollar company. So the stakeholder concept is good. And we already do stakeholder capitalism, whether you guys know it or not, that's how they, that's the whole purpose of the government. The whole purpose of the government is to intervene on behalf of the country in opposition to the shareholders in order to ensure that companies are acting in ways that are more beneficial to all of society rather than just letting the invisible hand hope that the, the hand doesn't decide to dump a whole bunch of like sewage into the fucking river or something, right? Right. Well, I mean, that's what I said. Hold on. You know, okay. Wait, I'm sorry. This Simon guy in your chat, he's streaming fucking me. Destiny thinks people vote at shareholder meetings to perform. Okay. No, they don't have to vote, you fucking moron. The funds are managed by people that are trying to return good performance to people that buy their funds. If your fund has a shitty return, nobody's going to buy your fund, dude. Why doesn't Destiny know that most of the shareholders he's talking about have no input in the company? You have input, you dumb fuck. You have input when you buy the fund. That's the whole point of buying the fund. You buy a fund. Wait, LOL, what it take? 95% lose all their money on crypto, the top performing financial asset of all time. Why couldn't you just tell me that at the beginning that you have 25 IQ? I'm sorry. I should have read that okay. message. I no, that's good. I, I'm, okay, I, go I'm glad. Go I wish that we could just have you argue with the chat. Bitcoin did um, 1,200% per annum on the five year chart. Oh, yeah. Why bro, are you did letting your portfolio Destiny do 1200%? argue with our chat? Come on. These it's, are our it friends. Is, <laughs> It I'm makes sorry. me feel better because I sorry. usually I'm the one arguing with the chat. The Simon uh, guy is a dumb. F- imagine citing the the imagine saying the overall performance of Bitcoin as a, as an entire class rather than what the individual like fucking makes on it. Like okay, bro, let me talk to you about the like who would cite the GDP of the United States as saying like every American is doing well? If you think most people are making money on crypto, you're actually fucking delusional. And I know you are because I know yeah, you're not was, making money on crypto. Because if you were making money on crypto, you wouldn't be in a fucking YouTube chat at fucking two forty a.m. telling everybody about how good crypto is. Okay. Hey, like finding your next shit. We've had time. crypto. So billionaires I'm just come in and here and give us lots of money, we right. did. but not at okay. two forty a.m. That's true. Okay. Um, Sorry. Anything else? No. Okay. No. What what I said ten hours ago was exactly uh-huh. sort of what you just said at the end, which is that that is what the role of the government is supposed to be. It's supposed to be the conflict mechanism, sort of saying, okay, well, the you know the shareholders and the private government and private entities, private corporations, they're kind of driven by their profit and they're doing what they're doing and they're motivated according to their shareholders and the government's supposed to represent kind of the will of the people via regulation. And that's supposed to be this conflict between the two of them. And I'm fine yeah, with yeah. that, uh-huh. but I don't see how that model can be embedded into a private corporation itself via the stakeholder model. <clears throat> and I think that's what I'm, I think that's okay, what's kind of like holding so up this. If you, if you want to get away from like the bullshit um, and you want to, you want to do like a, like an actual, Oh my God, am I going to be able to find this? De- Destiny, how did this panel come together? Like, was it, did they give you any lead on what you were going to be talking about or anything like that? Um, yeah. I mean, it just seems kind of Did like they say that you guys were going to argue about ESGs for an hour or was it just like the great? I didn't know what it was going to be about so. ESGs, but. Right. Um, Otherwise, I would have done a little bit more reading, and I could. Yeah, there was even more <laughs> random, stupid shit that this guy said. So James oh kind of. Wait, who am I thinking? There's a direction. there's a Wall Street Journal writer. Is it is his name Mark Levine? Who am I thinking of? I don't know. Who are you thinking of? What? Oh my god! I don't know. 
fuck, I don't remember the guy's name. He has a very, 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 um, he's a very, very interesting writer. He, he, he does a lot of writing for, um, it's either the Wall Street, I think it's the Wall Street Journal. Um, but basically this concept of like, he, he, hmm. Okay, you ask fuck. You asked me a question of like how the shareholders, the stakeholders. No, I said yeah. I said I'm fine with the government being uh-huh. the representative of the people. I don't see how it's going to work into the company itself. How to have the, sh- I, I the stakeholder? I like think the, the concept would be that like if you could peg, if, like if we could theoretically have a score like on mm-hmm. one to one hundred that shows like how like good quote unquote a company is in the long term for all of society. Oh, it's Matt Levine. Um, like that maybe like funds would be opting towards these companies because they can actually deliver more reliable, stable, long-term results would be the idea. Well, yeah, but reliable, like long-term investment strategies or like long-term health of the company isn't necessarily related to like the, how moral a company is, right? It has nothing to do with morality. It just has to do with long-term like stability, which can usually tie into morality. But I I mean, I guess, I I guess that's true ish. Um, I don't know. It, it's, I mean, part of it, I don't know how much you look into the ESG scores after this conversation. Cause when I, I looked into, into it, nobody like agrees on anything. It's like super yeah, it's, fucking it, chaotic. No one makes fucking yes, idea. It seems True. like a big scam. It seems like that's why people are calling for the SEC to regulate the, the, the scores. Cause there is no agreement. There's no standardization. There's no transparency. It does seem like a lot of bullshit. So I don't think that is the answer, but the, the, the I guess having this, Having a score like this that's supposed to, you know, talk about long term, you know, long term health. I don't know. I, I would be more I'd be more, I guess, on board with with them looking at this in in favor of like long term health as opposed to trying to make it a moral question. And I think that's what's getting James well, but like they're so triggered is that it ties into all like the woke diversity stuff. It's not about woke diversity. That's some boring shit. It's it's about like long term health of like financial companies. Um yeah, it, it's well. No, it's, so, well, some of the metrics is it's like oh, you know how. Here, okay, let me let me panel, see if I can, like, how you know. Like here, here is like an interesting thing that is possible now um, because of how big some of these funds have gotten. Mm-hmm. Um, we're, we're talking when we're talking BlackRock. I, I think they manage over sixty trillion dollars of funds. I think like right. s- like ten trillion actively, fifty passively, something. But like what? Um, the, here's like a possible thing that can happen with like an, a quote unquote ESG score that couldn't happen before. Okay. Um, let's say that you have a company, like, let's say you've got a bunch of airlines. Okay. Okay. Let's say that airlines, um, have you ever heard of like the tragedy of the commons or like, um, any of these, these ideas that like, if one party, um, if everybody is, acts in a certain way, it'll you're fuck really everything gonna up. really going to ask us that destiny? Really? Okay. I, okay Do we after, like, know about the tragedy of the commons? <laughs> okay. For fuck's sake. Okay. Damn. I'm just checking. Okay. But okay. <laughs> We're not let's the guy in the chat. Okay. <laughs> sure. Let, let's say that you have, um. Let's say that you have a company like an airline, okay? If this airline were to like either heavily restrict passengers, like do every other seat, or were to enact like really strict like masking shit or whatever, let's say theoretically that this creates a better society, but it creates an undue financial burden on the airline. Now, in our current system, nobody is going to invest in that airline because your your, your profits are going to be shit um, because the co- the company is taking these huge losses for what social responsibility? Like, who cares? But if we had a theoretical world where people could grade companies like this, a company like BlackRock, maybe they're managing assets on all of these other companies across the United States to where if the airlines would take a hit on their profits and be a little bit less efficient and space people out, there'd be less people getting sick that would fuck up other companies in their portfolio. So if this was the case, let's say that we could rate like Delta. American Airlines and United, and we give them like, okay, these guys get like a, a, a responsibility score of like 94. Even though the profit return isn't ideal, even though we probably wouldn't invest in a company like this, we're going to continue to invest in a company like this because if we invest in a company with a score that high, the fact that they're taking a hit on their profits to make sure that they're operating in a responsible way actually like buoys the rest of your portfolio. It actually helps the other companies in your portfolio perform well. And that's like the concept when you have these like mega asset managers of how historically you're never going to have an individual company take a hit to help society because you've got a fiduciary responsibility to your shareholders. But now when you've got massive asset managers that have their, their, their interests are broader than that, right? They've got interest in all these companies across society. Maybe we can have like a couple companies take hits in order to make sure that the rest of the economy does well. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. 
uh, theoretically, but I mean, I'm assuming you're saying that's not the way it's working now because I don't right think now, that like, is how they're working. How ESG have you ever heard the saying? It's now. like if you have like six standards that are a nightmare, if you create one cable, we can make everything better. And then now you have seven standards. It's like that, right? Like, yeah, everybody wants to do something like this, but it's really hard to implement it because you have to get people to agree on shit and probably not, you know? Yeah, but it seems like the current system and the thing that's triggering James and a lot of other people about this is that when you have, first of all, when you combine, you know, a lot of different sectors like environment, social and governments and all this stuff together to try to create one magical average with a bunch of different competing interests, you're going to have problems. And it seems like you can have situations where, you know, shell oil can be pumping 800 megatons of, you know, uh, emissions into the atmosphere. And yet they can have a positive ESG score because they say that, you know, we have a diverse, you know, they do all this diversity equity training stuff. And it seems like, a lot of these corporations under the current ESG rating system, they can do a lot of performative wokeness stuff to counteract real environmental harms or real actual harms or, you know, inflicting upon society. Yeah. And, and if, that, can, that, if that was the case, then I think that, um, then I think that that's like something worth talking about. But right now, I don't think the implementation of that is anything like that. Um, like nobody can really agree on like what an ESG score should be. Nobody can agree on like what can be responsible. Like, I don't think we're at that level. And I don't think that fund like portfolio managers are going to be too concerned about like the woke shit. Um, I think that you, you bring up, like there is an interesting conversation to be had about this stuff. James is not the guy that's capable of having that conversation because he doesn't understand financial markets. <laughs> that's true. If, you, if, you, if you don't have any concept of how capital markets work, then you, you, you have no business talking about this. If you're going to pretend that like diversity training is why uh, Disney's fucking stock dropped, like you're, you're off in another world. That's a fun conversation to go and have have like with some culture war loser, but um, there, there, yeah, there. I think there is an interesting conversation of like, you know, how can people assign these scores? What should the score even measure? How can we come together? Agreement? Is it even possible? It might not be, you know, which I think is a fair point for sure. Yeah, I mean, if they're going to do these scores, I think they'd all have to be. I, I don't think you can average them all together. I don't think you can average your you know, the environmental score with how your company organizes itself. Score. These are two different things. But yeah, to be maybe, yeah. to be to be a little okay, fair I got like two, I got like one more minute. So okay, we'll be just go? a little bit fair to James before you go. Mm -hmm. But the Disney stuff, I mean, he was I don't agree with James, but he was mm -hmm. saying that that it was, you know, Disney getting hit by DeSantis and the Republicans in Florida is what caused. Yeah, the, he's the he's just he's an idiot. He's wrong. He doesn't know. You don't think that has anything about. to do no, with this? No, of course not. Doctor? What happened was every single streaming platform took a huge fucking loss last quarter. Netflix is like in the fucking yes. shitter. They're talking about totally changing <laughs> model. CNN Plus got literally fucking canceled. Disney Plus, like um, I think lost subscribers or, or reported bad profits. Like every single online streaming platform took a huge fucking hit okay. um, last quarter. And this is probably mm -hmm. why Disney. But the idea that like Disney is losing money because of their uh, because of their fucking woke attempts or whatever like it's that's ridiculous like the fuck out of here you almost <laughs> got him to admit t to the disney's going to be gone in 10 years thing. <laughs> Which, well, because he realized is usually laughable. what I hear, this is like, this is a debate tactic. I will admit it. When I'm talking to doomsday dipshits, I'll usually immediately ask, like, oh, <laughs> do you want to, do you want to bet money on a time frame? Because I don't like that these guys make so much money and attention by strength of love. Oh, everything's going to be over in two years. This company's, oh, really? You really think so? Okay. I'll give you 10 to one mm -hmm. on 200 bucks. Okay. Or like 20 bucks. We'll make it a friendly bet. $5. Okay. I just put, put some money on it so that we can see who's right or wrong in a couple of years. Cause so many of these people make these doomsday predictions every six fucking months. It's like, bro, when the fuck is society going to collapse? Like, come on. Like it was supposed to happen seven times times over like i'm getting ready for the fucking zombie apocalypse and wow lo and behold the markets have recovered the housing markets are doing like whatever like yeah it's just it's very fucking annoying, this is so. a good opportunity to buy disney stock i mean that's what i was saying mm -hmm. so. well, maybe i don't know disney stock is pretty rough i think they're like i think they're even for where they were like five years ago but um but i mean like overall like yeah who knows well but. i mean we you want to wait we talked because it was funny because when we were watching that part of the debate we we're kind of looking into this and we kind of came to a similar conclusion about how a lot of this had to do with disney plus and how their streaming services, you know, they had a big boon last year because they had all their shows come out and now it's kind of a dry spell for them. And we were talking about whether, you know, if Disney goes back to offering dividends or not would be before I think Adam or anyone decides to start well, also, investing theme in Disney parks again. are opening up again because COVID's over. So, I mean, it could be a huge opportunity. Yeah, but again, uh -huh. is that how much is that going to materialize in stock growth? Actually, we'll see. Well, well, I guess we'll see. We, we can we reach out to you and have you on again, Dustin? I we've been streaming for like ten hours, so I'm just totally exhausted. But you should come yeah, on and argue with us sometime. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, 
Anytime you want. Um, there's people in your chat saying like, but Destiny say the same thing about climate change now? Yeah, of course. I would say the same thing about the medical community. I think one of the reasons why we took pandemic shit, I don't know how old you guys are, but I'm 33. I remember when they told us the bird flu was going to fucking kill everybody. I remember what it felt like every two years they were talking about some huge new H1N1, Z1, H1I1 or whatever was going to wipe out. Yeah. I mean, when I hear shit like that all the time, right. yeah, I take it less seriously. Same thing with climate change as well. People have been saying since I was 10 years old that like you yeah, know, every single course. fucking dolphin in the world was going to be, you know, eating shit and, and dying with all the free willy whales or whatever in the, in the harbors. And I mean, that <laughs> has happened so yeah i mean i would say that that's bad too any form of like alarmism over and over and over again is really bad ask him the pov question what is the pov question <laughs> oh, no, no. so when you watch porn destiny uh do you watch it as if you are the pov person in the porn or do you watch it as if you're like a third person voyeur i guess it would depend on the type of porn if it's like voyeurism porn then it'd be like you're a voyeur but otherwise i sure, imagine sure. you'd be like first person right Oh, well, you, that's it's, how I assume, I mean, but a lot of people don't view it that way. A lot of people view it all porn as if they're like a third person. Those people are strange, though, Destiny. Tell me you're not one of those people. <laughs> the, yeah, I mean, I don't watch it. That. I guess some people could, but. Okay. Well, the question that this arose from someone saying, is it inherently cuckish to watch porn? And I said, right. no, because you're. This was you're actually a Vosh argument. Vosh was saying that it is oh, that's cuckish right. that to is, watch that was porn. A Vosh yeah. Argument. yeah, I forgot about that. But it. if you're watching porn from the POV of the male actor, I, Destiny, you could be watching from the female actor. We didn't actually <laughs> we specify. Don't, we don't want to assume any genders. <laughs> but anyway. Are you, ta are you taking off and we're going to get back to the video or are you going to stick around? Um, yeah, I'm about to. Hold on. I'm just making sure it. It's fucking more. He, he wants to, are he you, wants to make sure there's no one else really, in chat. To, to, are you to really slide. that? I get super triggered when people say just random fucking stuff. The Simon W guy is like fucking 25 IQ, but I'm ignoring that guy now. Well, you, the more you talk about economics, the more I I feel like you have at least some understanding of economics. I mean, I was saying I, you were in the chat, so I'm sure you heard me saying that. I felt like this. I, I have like a, I have a, like an okay high school understanding of economics, which puts me ahead of like ninety. Well, you understand the supply and demand. That, you understand tragedy sure. of the commons. I mean, sure. <laughs> some some. I mean, I'm not sure. Like I was saying, I don't know that James does understand supply and demand, but no, because nobody cares. Because economics and finance is for fucking losers. Just look at the whole GME scandal shit. Like nobody had any fucking idea what the fuck they were talking about. There, there are probably people in your chat right now that are fucking bag holding GME at two eighty a share, waiting for that shit to go to one thousand dollars. It's never gonna fucking you. Yeah. You sold your GME. What are you doing, Diamond Hands <laughs> to the moon, Destiny? Bro. Why are you doing to me? Oh no! Total defeat from Destiny's own arguments. What is he saying? Destiny doesn't understand four hundred one k and is proven. What do I? What do I not understand? Tyro, Moonhopper. What the Where's fuck are you GME at? Because I heard someone say recently that they still had GME and it was doing pretty good. So, I don't <laughs> yeah, that's some no fucking clue. insane. It's at hundred. It's at hundred and twenty-five a share. That's crazy. What do you? That's yeah, it's still with? massively right. overvalued, but it's not at the it's still 10 million a share that. Yeah, but that's still yeah. up four hundred twenty-one percent. So yeah, that's funny. Okay. So Destiny, I, are you a, are you an MMT guy? Do you understand any MMT? I don't think I I don't know anything, dude. I'm a fucking oh, okay, okay. I don't think that like MMT makes any novel predictions that like any standard like Keynesian model would make. But but what the fuck do I? It's know? I don't know. it's descriptive, so it's not really meant to make. Well, I guess. Well, but it the is descriptions will lead to to predictions, right? Sure. Yeah. Forgiving student debt is probably a bad idea. It's going to create more inflation. So go buy. Forgiving them. student debt is bad because it pulls poorly. And because it's a dumb fucking idea, okay? These motherfuckers got their degrees. Well, that dude, too. I hate the middle class. When I was working class, I hated the middle class. And now that I'm upper class, I hate the middle class because I just fucking hate them, okay? They don't know how good they have it. Um, people that get fucking huge degrees, they spend $40,000 in debt and they've got like a degree. They're going on to be the biggest earners in all of society. They want their fucking debt to be forgiven. Why? So they can fucking buy another car so they can buy a house. Fuck you. Get the fuck out of here. You got yours. You got your degree. You're fine. You are like college degrees are literally the number one contributor to the growing wealth inequality in the United States because people that get degrees have like a $20,000 wage premium conferred on them instantaneously after graduating and these are the motherfuckers that want to bail out fuck you why don't you give money to the guy that like can't buy a car or the guy that can't fucking afford gas or the guy that has his fucking power shut off all day get the fuck out of here it's with that giving, loan forgiveness it's giving shit. money to the rich yeah it's terrible it's absolutely totally terrible. Fuck these but at the same time fucks. it's also going to make inflation worse because you should be probably a little bit yeah supply yeah 
well, just because you're basically going to be, you're going to be freeing up a whole bunch more money. We already have like an insanely overheated economy and we need to cool it the fuck off. And I don't know if forgiving all student loan debt is a good way to, to, to <laughs> no. pump yeah. the break. Hi, you just listened to a clip from the Sitch and Adams show. If you like what you heard, you can listen to our live show right here on this channel on Sunday, starting at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. And if you want, you can super chat us. We read $20 and up super chats on the show and then do a follow-up stream on the following Tuesday where we read the rest of the unread super chats and interact with fans of the show subscribe to this channel right here to listen to the live show or to listen to more of our awesome clips